Amen. So tonight, tonight we have uh, a handout that I've kind of, it's, and honestly, it's just Psalm 91, the New Living Translation. So we're going to kind of be looking at that, but also looking at it and from the King James, be reading uh, from that and giving you some definitions and things. We'll interject some things here and there. But I wanted to give you the New Living Translation. Uh, that way, everybody has a copy. And anytime the enemy tries to come against you, anytime sickness tries to come against you from the enemy or however it be, or just nature trying to come against your body, we can pull this out and we can read it, we can quote it, and we can, this would be, the reason I chose the new living, the reason I chose the new living translation is because it's more of how we speak now. So it would be easier to quote, easier to read, easier to just understand. So, as the Lord was dealing with me about this, I know that there's attacks of the enemy going on right now. There's sicknesses trying to creep up and to uh, attack our church. There's all kinds of different things. But Psalm 91 encompasses many aspects of the security and, and blessing of God, the protection of God. So we're going to dive a little into this. We'll see how far we get. If we need to continue next week, well, we'll do that. But if we don't, well, we'll just try to complete it tonight. Amen. So Psalm 91, I'm going to read from the King James Version, uh, but I, I want everybody to have the new living so we, don't, we may interchange. But King James says, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Now, this psalm declares protection and blessing, but it's only for those that abide in God. Only those that abide with God. So abide means to lodge, to remain, to stay. You know, you know, when you think about a hotel, you think about you don't abide there. You don't, you know, although they call it a lodge, you may go and sleep there, but then you leave and you move, you go on about your business. But your home is your abode. That's where you abide. That's where, you know, you may, you know, slip out to go to the store, you may slip out to go to church, but when you when you go back, that is where you dwell. That's where all your possessions is, that's where everything that you have is, is in that abode, in that in that home. So with this, we can automatically see that when we abide in the shadow of the Almighty, we make we dwell in the secret place, the most high. We know that we, we don't just visit God, we live with Him, we abide in Him, we stay in Him, we remain in Him. It's like, yes, we may go to work and, and you say, well, that seems kind of odd because God's everywhere, but our, our mind may transfer to, i got to do this right now for my job, but our heart, and when, we, when we, we're not thinking about our job, then we're automatically thinking about God again. Now, it's, you know, many Christians, especially in today's time, they think about God when they come to the house of God, and they think about Him when they, you know, when they need something, or you know, just ever so often they think about Him. But that's, that's not the standard for our life. The standard for our life is to be thinking of God all the time and be interjected with other things that we need to accomplish then, and then focus back on God. You know, a lot of times we get it backwards or we focus on God only when we're interjecting but, you know, from something that we're already doing. But we've got to be focused on God. We've got to stay, you know, our heart and mind fixed on God. Here comes that song again. We've got to stay, I've got our mind made up and our heart is fixed on God. Amen. But God provides a hiding place for those that abide in Him. Because notice, with this, in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Under the shadow, that means that you're close, in close proximity you know, when our boys, you know, when we go different places and they walk on, you know, in my shadow, that means they're close enough to me that they're right in the shadow of that. Now, we know with God there is no shadow of His turning, there's no darkness in Him, but we get the concept of being so close to Him that we're covered in the shadow of the Almighty. That we're so close that we're right there beside Him because we abide with Him. Now, God's people should not only believe but declare this. We see... Verse 2 says, I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God in Him will I trust. Now, the Lord should be our shelter, our hope, our trust, which is what refuge means. And He should be our strong place, our fort, our castle, our defense, which is what fortress means. So if He is all these things to us, and I notice 
Not only it, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God, will I trust in him, but it says, I will say of the Lord. I will say of the Lord. So not only do you act like it, you actually declare it. This is important because many people will say, well, you know, in their heart, I say, well, God can heal me if he wants to, or God can heal me, but they never declare it with their mouth. So with that, you say, well, what's the importance of that? You declare what you, you should be declaring what you believe. Because how is anybody else going to know it? How is the enemy going to know what you believe if you don't declare it? Now, you can believe it in here all day, but just it takes us back to Romans 10.10 10, where it says, with the heart you believe, but with the mouth you confess. So whatever you believe, you should be confessing. I mean, you believe in your heart that your job stinks and you declare it with your mouth. Why not declare the things of God that you believe in from your heart? Amen. But God's people should not only believe it, but we should declare it. But Christians must put their trust in God. Because notice the last part of verse 2. In Him will I trust. Now, trust means to have a confidence, a boldness, a security. But it also means that you have faith in. So if you have faith in God and you're declaring it, you're saying it, that He's your refuge, He's your fortress, then you must, in Him, we must put our faith. We must put our trust. We don't put our faith in our cold medicine. We don't put our faith in our job. We don't put our faith in our vehicle. We don't put our faith in our own well-being. We put our faith in God, which leads us to Hebrews 11. So if you want to hold your place in Psalm 91, let's go over to Hebrews 11 momentarily. Hebrews 11, chapter 1, or chapter 11, verse 1, excuse me says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So now substance is the essence, the assurance, the confidence, the support, or a setting under. Now this paints a picture of a foundation that you can stand on. So faith is that substance. Faith is that thing that you can stand on. When everything else seems to be sinking around you, when everything else seems to be falling apart, your faith should be that substance that you're able to stand on and not be wavered, not sink, not be able to be moved. But you're standing on it. It should be that substance for us. But it's the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. So now, this substance also paints a picture. When you look it up in, in the Greek, it, it it paints a picture of a foundation that you stand on. So you're not wavering, you're not moving, you're not sinking, you're not falling down, but it also paints a picture of a thing that goes over you. So now wait a minute. So if we have faith as something that we can stand on, we can stand firm in it because we're not being moved, we're not allowing the enemy to knock us down, to tear us down, but then also faith is something that can cover you it's kind of like, almost like an umbrella, but stronger concept than that. To where anything that tries to rain down upon you, you, you hold your faith up, and it blocks all of that stuff from coming on top of you. It's like finding shelter. So not only does it block you from sinking in sin, as the old hymn goes, but now it also covers you to keep things from raining down upon you, from things penetrating you, from things trying to, you know, we'll say, get you uh, wet and trying to bog you down. Because we know when you, when, you get, when you get rained on, you know, if it's not like one of those little sprinkles, it's usually like a good soaking rain. It, it'll soak you down and you feel so heavy, it's harder to walk. And you got everything, you can take your clothes off and just, you know, wring them out. And because we know the enemy doesn't throw little light darts, just little bitty things. When he's going to do it, he's going to do something heavy. He's going to do something that's trying to knock you down. So if we find and we put our faith in our, in the, in the, we put our faith, which is the substance of things that cover us, and we put that in God, then anything of the enemy that's trying to come at us, our faith will be able to block that. Which also leads us to the shield of faith. Because if we have a shield of faith, we know that that will, that will not allow things to penetrate through to pierce our heart, to pierce our bodies. But it builds upon that faith, that faith is that shield. Amen. So verse 2, for by it, meaning faith, the elders obtained a good report. Now notice that it says elders. Elders here means anybody that has come before this time. 
Anybody that has had faith in God, anybody that, that has sought God, that has lived for God, that has done what God asked them to do, but they had faith in Him. For it's by it, by faith, that the elders obtained a good report. Now, obtain means received a testimony. It also means received witness or give evidence. So obtained a good report means to receive a testimony. Because you know, how many times have we quoted about the three Hebrew boys? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. How many times have we quoted about Daniel? How many times have we quoted about David? How many times have we quoted about Moses? How many times have we quoted about Noah? I mean, we can, we can, if we continue reading the Hebrews 11... You know, it's by faith Abel, by faith Enoch, by faith Noah, by faith Abraham. We can see the great hall of faith here, but it's by that faith, by their, their not only declaring the things of God, but living it out, that they obtained a good report. They had a testimony. You know, I've, al I've, I've also heard the quote, without the test, you don't have a testimony. So if you don't have a test, you don't have anything that's staring you in the face for you to, to, you, you to go through to prove God, then what, what good are you? What good, what good is your life? What good is your testimony if you really haven't been through anything? You know, that's, you know, I've heard people kind of go back and forth about somebody say, well, you know, I think one of the greatest miracles or one of the greatest testimonies is for somebody that's, you know, been out in the world and done it all and then they come to God and it's such a wonderful thing. And somebody else says, well, I think the wonderful testimony is, is if somebody was, you know, got born again in an early age and lived their whole life for God. Either way, it's like one, if they're serving God and living for God, that's their testimony. You know, you got the testimony of, I know what sin is like. I know how it feels to be lost. I know what the prodigal son felt like. But yet I found God and I found that peace. Or you can say the other one that says, you know, yes, I've been born again for a very long time, all, you know, most of my life, but I've had those struggles. I've had things come against me, but I stood with God through it all. Both of them are a testimony, and I don't think either one of them has a greater weight than the other. Mo you know, no matter what walk of life that you're in, as long as you're serving God and have that testimony of saying, I, I looked to God and He got me through this. I looked to God, He got me through this. To have that kind of testimony, no matter what it is, is a blessing and a true honor towards God. Because that means that when something came at you, you sought Him and not your own, not your own strength. And you relied on Him and He got you through it. That you could be that witness, that testimony to others. But if we finish here in verse 3, it says, Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the Word of God. Now notice, it's through faith that we understand that. It's that faith. We don't believe in evolution. Some people have a faith for that. More power to you. I don't believe in it. I, don't, I didn't come from no primordial soup or some you know, uh, ugly gorilla. I didn't come from none of that. You may have. I believe we were fashioned in the image of God, just like God says. I'd rather believe that I come from God than a monkey. Amen. I'd, I'd rather believe I come from God, fashioned in His image, than some primordial soup. Some soupy thing. I know some people that's got a backbone like soup, but when it comes to the things of God, I'd rather be like Him. Amen. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed. They were framed. They were created by the Word of God. Even much like today, we can say all we want to of our own opinion, but you know the enemy's like, whatever, I'll, I'll attack you. It doesn't matter. But when you start pulling out the Word of God, and you start quoting that because you believe in it, then you're going you're gonna to raise the sword of the Spirit against him. Because your opinion all day long, enemy, I don't like you. Enemy, you can go back to hell. Enemy, I don't like you at all. You're just a stinker. You're just this. You're just that. The enemy's just going to laugh at you. If you say, you know what? In the name of Jesus, I'm a tither. I declare the devour rebuke for my sake. Malachi 3 says this. Malachi this. And you start quoting the Scripture. That's the Word of God. This right here says the worlds were framed by the Word of God. So how about our life be framed by the Word of God? Because when we believe in the Word of God, that's going to build our faith because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So when we start building our faith on the Word of God, you start quoting it, you start hearing it, 
And you start hearing it from you know, the pastor. You start hearing it from other ministers. You're, you're, what you're doing is you're, assen- you're essentially in a do loop of making and you're building faith by quoting faith, by hearing faith, and you're building it. So now you're building the thing that you're standing on, but you're also building the thing that's covering you so the enemy has no penetration toward you. Then you're also building your shield. So I don't know what's, what more you, God could give you. Because if your faith is being built in Him and the Word of God, then you've you got a firm foundation, you've got a faith roof over your head, and you've got the shield of faith that's blocking out anything that anybody would try to throw at you. But yet people, all the time, they put more faith in other things than they do, they do God, which is sad. Because those things did not frame the world. God's Word did. So that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. So that things which are were so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. So they're not visible. Amen. So let's go back to Psalm 91. So we'll look at verse 3. Surely He shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler. So surely, surely he will deliver, which means to snatch away, to recover, to rescue, to save you from the traps of the fowler, the one who ensnares, the one who entangles. Now, we could say, well, if we quote Psalm 91, then why why do we still get sick? Why do we still have these issues? Because God will still deliver us. That's what this is saying. That's the reason I wanted to point this word out here from deliver to recover something means that it was tried to be taken away. To rescue something means that something tried to pull it away. To snatch away means something was trying to be taken. You know, it's like it makes me, you know, think of the military missions where they have rescue missions, they have recovery missions to where somebody was taken or something was taken and the military had to go back and get it. Now, you can say, well, the Bible says that we're, you know, we can't, uh, I'm trying to think of the, the verse where it says nothing can take us away, you know, snatch us out of God's hand. Uh, it's not, the exact quote's not coming to me. But nothing can separate us from God. But it's, when we think about that, nothing can separate us, which means that we may not leave his physical presence. We may not leave where he's at, but that doesn't mean that something will try to pull away pull you away or take you away. You know, just like, you know, if, if you're, you know, let's, let's take, you know, Walmart, for example. I imagine to fit that in this time. So if we're at Walmart and somebody's got a, you know, got their purse, you know, hopefully it's a lady, got their purse in their cart and they're shopping, all of a sudden they turn around and look at, to look at their, you know, look at something that's on the rack, let's say, you know, clothes or something. Although the cart's right here and the, and the, the purse is right here, that doesn't mean that some, some idiot is going to not just walk by and try to walk off with the purse. Right? Everybody following what I'm saying? Although she may be right here and the purse is right here, that doesn't always deter somebody from coming and trying to grab the card or grab the purse and walk away with it because they're a thief. Well, what's the Bible say? The thief cometh, cometh to steal, kill, and destroy. So that means he's trying to take it away. And he knows that God's people are going to be close to him. But the more that we lack abiding with him, the further out we're, we are from him. So we must abide with him. But that still doesn't mean that he's going to leave us alone just because we're next to God. You know, that's, you know, that's why even you know, the word says that we submit ourselves to God and resist the devil. So that means there's still got to be a submit and a resist. So just because you submit doesn't mean that he's just going to walk away. You submit and resist, and then he'll flee. The same goes for this. So God will deliver. He'll snatch away. He'll recover. But this is a promise from God when you abide with him that he will be there to deliver us. Because even, you know, let's let's take sickness, for example. And so I've got, I'm fighting this sickness. I'm fighting this disease. Well, that doesn't mean that you know, it will never come close to you just because you serve God. It may come, but God is faithful. God will deliver us. God will give you healing. God will, you know, he will touch your body and help you and bring you out of that to rescue you, to help you recover from that. But God will deliver you from the, from the traps of the fowler, the one who ensnares or entangles. 
But if we keep reading, it says, and the noisome pestilence. The noisome pestilence. Which there means perilous or deadly pestilence. We would say it's noisome is ruin or calamity of. So he keeps you from the ruin or calamity of pestilence. Now pestilence, I, I trust me, I looked up a lot of words from this chapter. So we're going to get into a lot of definitions tonight. Pestilence. If you're going to write anything down, I would write this down. Pestilence means disease. It means famine. Disaster. Flood. And sword. So I'll say those again. Say those again. Disaster. Disease. Famine, flood, and sword. Well, why is that important right now? Because sickness tries to come in the form of a disease. Famine tries to come from a lack of a lack of bread, a lack of water, a lack of supplies that you have. Disaster, anything falling apart in your life, the enemy's going to try to do. Flood. Now, you could say, well, that kind of falls under disaster. What about a flood of emotions? What about a flood of doubt, a flood of fear? That doesn't fall under disaster, but it's still a flood. And then you also have the sword and the attack of the enemy. That's maybe spiritual in nature or however. But notice that God will deliver not only from the traps of the fowler, but also from the ruin or calamity of disease, famine, disaster, flood, and sword. That's there's not hardly a, a, a category that you can think of that falls outside of that. So that means that God will deliver from anything and everything. God will rescue, but it all amounts to you must abide in Him. So now let's look at verse 4. We're only 4 into 16 of them, so we're a quarter of the way there. Amen. He shall cover thee with His feathers... And under his wings shalt thou trust. So now we know this picture kind of paints the bird or animal covering where he covers you with the feathers and under his wings. But it says, and under his wings shalt thou trust. So God covers those that abide with him and with his feathers like an animal that protects the young, which, which is where you can find safety and security. Because when you're in somewhere safe and secure, you begin to trust. But what did we say earlier? Trust also is faith. So not only are you building trust in God, but you're also building faith in God. So when you are in that safety and that security of God, it's, it's, it's like when God says to try me, to test me. What he's doing is saying, if you'll test me, if you'll try me, I'm going to prove my faithfulness, and the more you're going to start believing in me. The more that you do that, the more you're going to believe in me, and all it's going to do is benefit you. So we must seek God. We must abide with Him, but we must also try Him. Say, Lord, Your Word says. Lord, Your Word says. You know, like even when we're fighting sickness and disease, say, Lord, Your Word says that by the stripes of Jesus, I am healed. I declare my healing. He wants that Word to come back to Him. Because if we don't, then it's, it's, I want to say it's coming back to him void because it's really not coming back to him at all. But if we're quoting that back to God, we're also quoting it to the enemy because they can hear everything that we say. But we're quoting that back to God saying, Lord, your word says. So in other words, Lord, you promised. Your word says you promised, Lord, that I could have healing in my body. And just like a good father, any good father that's reminded of their promises, they're going to follow through. There's been times where, you know, my boys have reminded me of something I've said, and I'm like, yeah, you're right. I better, make, I better make good on that, or I'll be a liar, and I don't want to be that. Amen. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. His truth. Notice it's not your truth. It's not whatever truth you feel like today, as everybody tries to teach nowadays. But it's His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Now, the shield, we, can, we know the picture of you know, a shield that you know, used to hold up. You know, probably now everybody thinks of Captain America because he's probably the closest one that has a shield for modern times. 
But for that shield, when you hold it up, it blocks the things away. We know that's the shield of faith, but also a buckler. Now, I want to give you a definition for that. Buckler means protection or defense. Well, that makes sense. That's too easy. Protection and defense. Okay. But here's something I found interesting. When you look up the word buckler, it also means something that surrounds a person. So not only do you have the shield, which is we know is, is probably uh, you can only def- deflect one side or protect one side, but the buckler covers the person. It goes all the way around. So that means that no matter what, God has got you covered. But you got to abide in Him. Amen. That's like right now, you know, God forbid, I'm not protecting my home. I'm not there to protect it. So if we step away from God in sin, we go out to choose sin, then God can't, He's not going to protect us because we don't belong to Him. Just like the prodigal son, when he wandered out away from the father, the father couldn't protect him. It wasn't until he came back to father's house and got close to the father again that that father declared, that is my son. Now I can, I can bless him, I can help him. But just like when I go home later, now I'm, I'm going to be there to protect my home. Now, in the natural realm, you know, you got you know, alarms or whatever, things of that nature to try to protect it while you're gone. But we see the picture here of when we're away from God and we choose sin because God's not going to quit. He's not going to quit loving you and He's not going to be the one that shoves you away. It's got to be us that says, you know what? I would rather have this sin or this thing in my life than God. That means you're no longer abiding in Him, but you're choosing to abide in whatever you're choosing. So we must abide with Him if we want these promises and the security of God. Now, verse 5, Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night. Amen. Terror means alarm, fear, or dread. So we shouldn't be scared. We shouldn't be scared of the terror, the alarm, the fear, the dread. You know, it's like you know, when the tornado happened, uh, I think it's maybe almost, we're approaching two years now, believe it or not. And Cookville, uh, we were there and we, we got woken up in the middle of the night and we turned on the news and things of that nature and, and got down in our basement. And us and the boys, we began to pray. We was like, Lord, don't let this thing come nigh us. Don't let this thing come near us. We declare this thing will not come close to us. Father, protect our church people. Protect you know, all, you know, a pastor and his family. Protect everybody, that we, you know, all of our family and friends. We, declare, we declared that out loud and prayed it. And we know that um, there was nobody that we knew that lost their life, but there were people that did lose their lives, and that's not negating that. But, what, but since then, many people have become afraid of going to sleep at night because of tornadoes. And that's like a terror by night. You say something that, that can come in the middle of the night. Now, that terror, you know, as we said, is alarm, dread, or fear. But what kind of terror are there besides that? You know, people get scared that somebody's going to break in their house during the night. People are afraid that, you know, something bad will happen and they're leery of the darkness and what it can hide now you can say well in a sense that makes that makes sense naturally but when we serve god none of this should ever bother us does that mean you won't have a natural fear like you just automatically should be you know (laughs) cured of your fear of spiders or fear of heights or things of that nature no but we must work on those things that we don't allow fear to control us because god's not given us the spirit of fear but of power Love and a sound mind. So if we know that God doesn't give it to us, why would we keep it? But this says right here, says, you shall not be afraid for the terror by night. In other words, God's saying, you don't have to be. You can choose to be, but you don't have to be. Because if you abide with me, I'm going to take care of you. He's already said, I've got a shield for you. I've got a buckler for you. I've got all these things. I'll rescue you. I'll deliver you. I mean, he's already given us so many promises, and we're only the fifth verse into 16. God's already got us covered, and he's just, he just keeps telling us, I've got you covered. I've got you covered. I've got you covered. Better than any insurance company you could ever buy into. He said, I've got you covered. But don't be afraid of the terror by night, nor the arrow that flieth by day. So now he's covered the night and the day. The arrow is the wound or the dart that comes in from the daytime. Now we would think, we probably mostly think of, you know, 
natural wars or things of that nature that you can see coming in in the day as the picture is painted here by the arrow. But God is telling us he's got us covered. We don't have to be afraid at nighttime, but anything that tries to come at you that you can see, you know, even in the daytime, in the daylight, that you can even see it coming at you. Don't be afraid of that either because I'm with you. Amen. Verse 6, Nor for the pestilence, there's that word again, that walketh in darkness. So don't be afraid of the, of the disease, the famine, the disaster, the flood, the sword that tries to travel in the darkness, the little, the little things that try to come while it's dark. You know, that's why sinners love darkness. That's why bars are dark. That's why clubs are usually dark. That's why you find all the sin usually happens in the dark. What about affairs? Usually in the dark. A lot of things goes on in the dark, and they're usually not good. Now, let me rephrase that. Huh. Married couples in the dark, that's legal in the eyes of God, as long as you're married to one another. So let's clarify that. But sin is covered in darkness, and people think they can hide it, but you can't hide it from God. Sin, you know, people... <laughs> People drink, people do other things. They try to hide it in the dark, but you're not hiding that. Everybody knows it. When you're stumbling around dog drunk, and you're stumbling around and can't even talk, everybody knows what you've been doing. When you reek of, you know, sex or alcohol or drugs or whatever, everybody knows what you've been doing. Why? I mean, I don't want to say why hide it, because you, if, you're, if you're brave enough to do it, you shouldn't want to hide it. That means there's shame. That means you're ashamed of what you've been doing. So why hide it? Or you can make it right, not walk in shame any longer, and abide under God, abide with Him, and walk in, and walk in boldness, walk in authority, walk in power, love, and a sound mind. Oh, there's that verse again. But when you walk in fear and maybe timidity, and you walk in maybe shame, that's not of God. That's another way to check yourself before you wreck yourself. <laughs> nor the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. Now, wasteth means to swell up or to devastate. So now we've got the pestilence, the things that travel in the darkness, but you've also got the destruction that wasteth or swell it. We've all probably seen those animals, especially in the summertime when they're dead on the side of the road, and all of a sudden that, that thing starts swelling up because of the gases and things inside that body. You know what's about to happen if that thing's not dealt with. And it's going to go everywhere. Yeah. And then you've really got a mess. But guess what? The Lord says don't be afraid of that. Don't be afraid of that destruction that tries to swell up, the things that try to devastate you, the things that try to come against you. Why? Because we abide in Him. He takes care of us. Verse 7. A thousand shall fall at thy side and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Now, we can quote this verse. You know, we can quote this verse to say, it doesn't matter how many around us are falling, peril, or falling into peril, falling into other things. If we are abiding in God, it does not have to come near us. Now, let me say this. That word nigh, now we, we could say come near us, things of that nature, and that would be partially accurate. So we can say, well, if, if everybody around me is facing this, it's not going to come near me. That I don't have to face it at all. What this verse means, when you look up nigh, it means it will not overtake you or become you. So now, we, we can use it as it won't come near us, but the verse is actually saying, whatever that is that is causing all of these to fall, it will not overtake you. It will not have victory over you. It will not become you. You don't have to be part of that number. Verse 8, Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. Only with thine eyes. So he's saying, you're not going to have to partake in that. You'll see it with your eyes. You know, it's like, you know, it, you know, if you're watching somebody afar off or you're watching something on TV, you're seeing it. You're seeing everything that's going on, but you're not really a part of it. And that's the way that it should be with us 
for those that, that have chosen to live in sin, those that have chosen sin over God or anything, however you want to say it, we don't have to partake in that. But we, with our eyes, will see the reward of the wicked. Let's see here. I thought I had a definition of reward. I must have left it on my other page. That's all right. We have to see the reward of the wicked. Now notice verse 9. Because thou hast made the Lord, which is thy refuge, even the Most High, thy habitation. Now notice here, it's because we have made the Lord our refuge, our shelter, our hope, our trust, even the Most High, our habitation, our home, our retreat, our dwelling, that this will not come near us. But notice the Lord's almost saying again, it's because you're abiding in me. Now if we... Take these last two verses and put them together as far as you know, verse 8 and verse 9. It's because when you're with God and you're close to Him, He's not going to let those things, you know, one, come near you, overtake you because you're with Him. If He doesn't partake in sin, how is that going to overtake Him if you're with Him? Now, uh, I was thinking of an example, but I'm not going to use it. So, if we say, because thou hast made the Lord, because we made him our refuge, because that's where we dwell, because that's who we're with, because we've chosen to make him our shelter, because we abide in him, we make him our dwelling place. Verse 10 continues and says, there shall no evil befall thee. But it's all hinged upon abiding with God. There shall no evil befall thee. Now, befall means to conquer or be delivered to so no evil when you're with God no evil is going to conquer you no evil you will not be delivered to any evil but it also says no plague come nigh thy dwelling or no plague no blow no infliction no wound no stripes no spot oh wait a minute now if a plague means a blow it means infliction it means a wound, it means stripes, it means a spot. But the Lord says here, no plague will come nigh your dwelling. Reminds me of another verse. Jesus is coming back for a glorious church, one without spot, wrinkle, or blemish. So that means if we tie those together, you must abide with God, you must abide with Jesus Christ to be that glorious church that you can still have these promises and be part of that church that goes to meet Jesus. But no plague will come nigh our dwelling. Now, nigh here has a different term. Man, see what you, see what you find when you study? See, I, I honestly, it, when I first read that, I thought, oh, that's the same word. I thought, nah, you know, I'm just going to double check just to make sure. And it was different. It will not stand or join within your home. It will not stand at your door. It will not stand against your home. So that means no evil will befall you. It won't conquer you. No plague will, will stand within your home. Now notice, when you say it will not stand in your home, that means it may try to come, but you can say, get out of here in Jesus' name. I ain't putting up with you. You leave my house. You know, that's like when we've had sickness, you know, especially when I had laryngitis a little while back and things that were trying to attack us because I knew the enemy wasn't happy with us, I didn't just sit around and say, well, I guess I just can't really talk anymore. I guess I can't preach. No, I didn't give up. I was like, I'll be doggone if I let this thing overtake me because I believe too much in my God to allow this to overcome me. So guess what we did? We quoted the word. We prayed. We sought God. Kept after it. And I'll tell you, I may not have been as loud as I am like right now or before it happened, but even then, my voice would come back to some degree where I could get up here and teach and preach, and then it would almost go back the way it was when I get off, oh, I get off the podium, or I get away from the pulpit. Now you tell me God ain't real. For my voice to be weak and not barely talk from my office, to step up here to be able to talk and to preach and to say what I need to say and then go back to there where I can't hardly talk again. You tell me God ain't alive and well. 
That's called the anointing. That's called abiding in Christ. Called abiding in God. But see, you can say, well, if you really abided in God, then, then you would have had it you know, start to finish. You wouldn't have bothered you that much. I'll tell you this, what, I'll tell you this much. All of that was, was allowing me to minister and do what I need to do is under the anointing. But as I went back, all that was was trying to play games with my mind and my faith of trying to say, well, see there, God didn't really do nothing for you. God let you speak, but God's still not moving in you. You must not be as good as you think you are. No, you shut up, enemy. I am the healed of God in the name of Jesus. You're not going to sway me. You're not going to bother me. You just get on with your bad self. <laughs> Feeling a little punchy and a little jokester tonight. Amen. I don't know what kind of a mixture this is. <laughs> Huh. Amen. But we don't allow the enemy to come at us like that and let him walk all over us. Because we're about to see that in just a moment. But there shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over thee. He gives his he sends his angels to protect us, to keep thee in all thy ways. So no matter in what you're doing, no matter where you go, God sends His angels to have charge over us. Now, I personally believe that we, we have our own angels that are, are assigned to us, but I also believe there's angels from heaven that will help and intervene. But, you know, that's another sermon for another time. But with that, when this says, even right here, that God will send His angels, He'll give His angels charge over us. Now, does that mean they dictate every, what we do? No. He gives charge over us to protect us and be, and be that, that shield and that uh, kind of extra protection against the enemy. He gives charge over us that they're there to help go and do what God wants to do, those messengers, those protectors, to keep thee in all thy ways. Verse 12, they shall bear thee up in their hands. They shall bear you up in their, with their hands. Now, these angels will hold you up because of your faith. Amen. That's why they're holding you up. Because if you had a faith in yourself, why would they hold you up? Because they're on charge from, from God. They belong to God. They're His angels. Why would they be intermingling if you got more faith in you than you do God? So we must have faith in God. We must abide with Him. Amen. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. Now, the word dash means to stumble, be hurt, or be defeated. Now, I will say it also means to stub. So it says, lest thou dash, or you can say stub thy foot against a stone, or I stub your toe. But when you look up that word, it also means that you will not stumble, you will not be hurt, you will not be defeated. You can almost say, you'll not be hurt, you'll not be defeated because they're lifting you up so much so that you won't even stub your toe on anything that's trying to come against you. That's how these angels are lifting you up. But it's because of our faith in God because we're abiding in Him. Amen. Verse 13. Thou shalt tread up on the lion and the adder. You can tread, which means go over, walk. Here's one I found interesting. You can cause to bend. To make a lion cause to bend, that takes some power. To make a, a snake or an adder, a serpent, cause to bend, you can say, well, that's not, that's not that much because you know, they don't have you know, backbone, things of that nature. But to make it bend and almost get backwards because it knows the power that you have to tread over it, that's some power too. To know that you can walk on those things, that you can tread over them, you can walk on them, means that you have power. But it doesn't come from us, but it's from power from God. It's, come, it's coming from Him. But now notice, it's also interesting that God would say the lion and the, and the cobra or the adder, because the lion represents the big thing in your life that's screaming and roaring, just you know, all mouth, got big bite ready just to devour you. But then you also got the adder or the snake, the little slimy thing that tries to weasel his way into your life. You, we have power over both scenarios. We have power over the big things that try to scream in our face, and we got power over the little small things that try to slither their way into our life as well. But it says that we can tread upon them. That means we can stomp on their ugly head and say, get out of here in Jesus' name. It says you will trample 
the young lion and the dragon, or the uh, serpent, shall thou trample, trample under feet, which means you walk upon abusively. So now you've got where you can walk on them, but now this trample means you're walking on it abusively. You're stomping on it. So that means not only do you just barely walk on it, but now you get to stomp on that thing and say, I told you to get out of here in Jesus' name. Amen. Verse 14. Because He hath set His love upon me, therefore will I deliver Him. Now notice, all of this is God talking. Like talking you know, through this as a promise to all of us. So now, taking it in that context, because we could say, because God has set His love upon me. But that's not what He's saying. He's saying, God's saying, because he has set his love upon me. Therefore will I deliver him. It's almost like one of my boys, because they love me because they're my child, if they were in need, I would go to them and help them. That's what God is saying here through this, through this song. Because he's saying, because that person has set their heart and their love on me, I'm going to be there for them. Because they abide with me, because they're within my house, we could say, I'm going to take care of them. I'm going to deliver them. Therefore will I deliver him. But notice he doesn't stop there. He says, I will set him on high because he hath known my name. Now, you know, I, I know there's a song that says, you know, he knows my name, talking about God knows my name, which is, that's good, that's fine and good. But it's more important for us to know his name. To know it in the proper context of, oh yeah, that's just God. No, that's God Almighty. That's the the master of the world as the master of everything as the creator of the heavens and the earth as the creator of all mankind he's so majestic so wonderful he's the only true and living god but because we know his name now notice verse 15 he shall call upon me so now again this isn't Somebody saying, God's going to call upon me. This is God saying, when He, when that person that abides in me, that loves me, calls upon me, I will answer Him. That right there should give you enough ground to tell the enemy when he says, oh, God doesn't answer you. Oh, yes, He does. He says He does. Because I abide with Him. Now, if you've turned your back on God, then God's going to say, I'm not going to answer you until you get things right with me, until you ask for forgiveness. Then we'll talk. But this, he says, I will answer him because he loves me, because he abides with me, because he's with me, and I'm with him. I'm going to answer him. Now, again, that may not be a microwave answer where you get your ding, where you're just right on the spot. It may not be like that, but God says, I will answer him. Uh-oh, here we go. Now the enemy's in real trouble. I will be with him in trouble. It's kind of like having your bodyguard with you everywhere you go. But it's the Lord. You know, it's, 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 you know when the enemy tries to come at you and say, no, 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 no. We're not putting up with that today. We're not putting up with that today. Jesus, not that we boss Jesus around, but we said, Jesus, I'm using the authority you've given me to rebuke this thing in, the na in your name. So in the name of Jesus, I command you get out of here and leave me alone. Because he'll deliver us. He's with us in times of trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. Notice not only he doesn't just deliver, but he delivers and honors. Why? Because we've honored him. Because when you abide with Him, because you've set your heart on Him, because you love Him, because you've done all these other things that is required of us, then why wouldn't He honor you? Because God's going to honor those that honor Him. God's going to love those that love Him. God's going to bless those that bless Him. You say, wait a minute, I thought God loved us before we knew Him. He did. But how much more is He going to honor us as His child, as His servant, than somebody that doesn't know Him? I will deliver him and honor him. Now, I will say, verse 14, deliver 
means to slip out, to make escape, and to make safe. But verse 15, (laughs) I will deliver him and honor him. That has a different meaning. It means to equip for a fight. But it also means to loose, to pull out, to make depart, to get you out of there. But it also says, I'll equip you for the fight. So if we have this mindset of God will not only deliver us and get us out of trouble, but in times, there may, there may be times where we say, all right, Lord, I need you to deliver me. And he puts on the armor of God for us. He helps us put on the armor to say, you know what? All right, now I'm ready. Now you're in trouble, enemy, because he's with me, because he said he'll be with me in trouble. He answered me. He heard my prayer. He equipped me for this battle. Now you, can't, you ain't got a leg to stand on. I'm going to chop you down with the sword of the Spirit. There's nothing you can do that's going to make, make me fall now. Because my God is with me. He's given me power and authority. He's given me love and a sound mind. I love the Word of God. I love my God. And you don't stand a chance. Amen. But he doesn't quit there. God doesn't quit there. Verse 16. Last but not least, and we're right on time, with long life, with long life, doesn't mean you're going to leave early if you don't want to. Doesn't mean you don't get to finish your race unless you don't want to. But with long life, I just, you never know. I may just go at any time. No, if you want to stay here, God says with long life, Will I satisfy him? I plan to live a long time unless the Lord comes back and he raptures us. Because I want to run my race. I don't want to be cut short. That's why I've you know, tried to get better about the things in my life. Try to exercise, try to eat right, try to do all these things. Am I perfect? No, not at all. But I'm trying to not say, all right, God, I want you to give me long life while I'm in the, while I'm in the background cutting off time of my life because I'm being foolish and not a good steward over my body or I'm playing with sin and waiting for the paycheck of that while I'm telling God I want a long life God but yet I want to play with this which I know the wages of sin is death so you can't play both because you'll wind up in the middle where God said I tried to give you a long life but you cut it short because you wouldn't leave death alone so I've got to give you the reward as we said earlier in these verses in verse 8, it says, and you'll see only with your eyes if you abide in Him, you'll see the reward of the wicked. But what if you're part of that wicked that you want to leave it alone? It's not going to be with your eyes. You're going to experience the reward of that wickedness. But with long life will I satisfy Him. Now, satisfy means to fill, to give plenty. It means you'll be full. You know, I actually had, uh, I had a family member recently talked about how you know, it'd be nice just to go to sleep in the Lord. And, and Miss Tiffany and I were talking about that's actually the, the biblical way to go. Is when you're just done, you say, Lord, I've run my race. I've kept the faith. I'm ready to go. I just want to go to sleep, gather all my family around me and tell them I love them. Tell them I, I'll see you all on the other side. But right now, I'm just, I'm ready to go. I'm just done. And you just go to sleep. Wake up in heaven. But... That should be with long life. That should be because we have chosen, I'm done. Not because we've given in to fear and saying, oh, I don't know, I don't know. No, we say with long life will he satisfy us when we abide with him. But I noticed not only that, he didn't stop there. And show him my salvation. So with long life will God satisfy, but he will also show salvation. Now, I want you to write this down as well. Salvation means deliverance, prosperity, aid, help. But I saved these two for last on purpose. Salvation also means health. Salvation also means victory so if we read that verse again with long life will I satisfy him and show him my victory I'll show him my prosperity I'll show him my help I'll show him health I'll show him my aid 
I'll show him my deliverance. But if we go back to verse 1, it's only for those that dwell in the secret place of the Most High and they abide under the shadow of the Almighty. So we must abide. We must look to God. We must put our faith and trust in Him. Amen. Does anybody have any questions tonight? Amen. Well, you can take your... Yes, ma'am. Amen. 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 That's right. Reminds me of the military term. We we always say, I got your six, which means I got your six o'clock. I've got your back. Because when you walk in formation, the last guy, poor thing, he's always the one that was, you know, if everybody's walking this way, he wouldn't have to walk like this. You have to look like this right here. And he'd take a few steps and he'd have to turn back around like this right here. So it was always that last guy. You always felt bad for him because he had to do the swivel at the very end when everybody else just gets to focus on the side or straight ahead. Amen. Not that we feel sorry for God, but he's got our back. We don't have to worry about it. We can say, Lord, I know you've got my future. You've got my present. But you've also got my past. You've got my back. You've got everything that is behind me. You've got everything that will try to attack me from maybe my past or from the, the things that try to creep up behind me. Lord, I know that you've still got it. And I don't have to worry about it because you are my rear guard, because you are there to protect me and help me. Amen. Amen. Anything else tonight? Amen. All right. Well, we'll pray. Make sure you take your Psalm 91 with you to quote, to pray with, to just have it with you. I don't say it all times because it might be awkward to carry around everywhere you go, but try to have it handy where you can have it to pray and to declare the Word of God. Amen.